Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and episode 43 of the Jimi Hendrix story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we deep dive into June 1970. In an action-packed episode, we explore Jimi's continuing Cry of Love US tour. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to related videos, performances, and stunning photographs from the period. With the Band of Gypsies album in the charts, plus the Woodstock film and album recently released, the US leg of the Cry of Love tour quickly picked up momentum. June of 1970 saw 11 performances in 10 cities, Dallas, Houston, Tulsa, Memphis, where Jimmy met Larry Lee backstage and borrowed his guitar for a few songs, Evansville, Baltimore, Albuquerque, San Bernardino, Ventura and Boston with two canceled performances scheduled for Denver and Pittsburgh. June was also notable as Jimmy got to inaugurate his recently completed studio joint venture with Mike Jeffery, the former Generation Club, turned Electric Lady Studios. Friday the 5th of June, Memorial Auditorium, Dallas, Texas. Concert set list, Spanish Castle Magic, Foxy Lady, Machine Gun Freedom, Star Spangled Banner, Purple Haze and Easy Rider. Saturday the 6th of June. Sam Houston Coliseum, Houston, Texas, before an audience of 8,000 with support act Balin Jack. Concert set list, Johnny B. Good, Getting My Heart Back Together Again, Fire, Foxy Lady, I Don't Live Today, Purple Haze, Red House, Ease I Rider, Machine Gun, The Star Spangled Banner and Hey Joe. The following appeared in the Houston Chronicle, titled Gypsies in Coliseum, Hendrix Hypnotism, by Jill Melikar. A gold star to Concerts West for one of the finest rock concerts that Houston's hip audiences have ever experienced. Even the Coliseum didn't seem like such a bad place for Jimi Hendrix since the show began practically on time, and the near-capacity crowd had surprisingly few gendarmes to trip over. Ball and Jack from Seattle, Washington opened. It is a good jazz rock group with six tremendously talented musicians. They totally captured the audience with their hypnotic music and message of brotherhood. After a decently brief intermission, Jimi Hendrix and his band of gypsies strolled on stage. The audience rose to its feet, more a gesture of homage than anything else. Hendrix, one of the brighter peacocks among superstars, was a rainbow-like sight to behold. He wore black leather-flared pants, tie-dyed chiffon shirt, multi-hued sequined vest, a super-colorful silk headband, and a multicolored rope belt. Too much. Hendrix and his guitar ran the gamut of an unbelievable repertoire. Rock and roll, rock, Johnny B. Good, blues rock, getting my heart back together, acid rock, let me stand and foxy lady, hardest rock, will I live tomorrow, and much more. Every number had that undeniably dynamic Hendrix magnetism and smooth professionalism. Hendrix is better than ever. He has mellowed greatly since his days with the experience. He has his head together. Sunday the 7th of June, Assembly Center Arena, Tulsa, Oklahoma, with support act Balling Jack. Concert set list, introduction, Spanish Castle Magic, Stone Free, Hey Baby, Hey Joe, Freedom, I Don't Live Today, Foxy Lady, Red House, Message to Love, Room Full of Mirrors, Flamenco Passage, Star Spangled Banner, Purple Haze, Easy Rider and Voodoo Child, Slight Return. According to the Jimi Hendrix Forum, after a rather successful start, the musical quality of this concert declines inexorably. Jimmy seems little involved, honoring these dates for purely contractual reasons, in order to finance his own studio, The Electric Lady. While in the Tulsa Daily World, in a disparaging review titled Hendrix Loud Noise Not Very Appealing, Bob Beck wrote, The Jimi Hendrix experience hit Tulsa Sunday night, something the city could have done without. The best description of the show, Hendrix on guitar, Mitch Mitchell on drums and Billy Cox on bass, is that it was a bad experience. That may sound like a pun, but it is the nicest thing to be said for the hour and a half of noise that blared from the Civic Assembly Center arena and entranced 4,700 teenagers. Not that the entire show was a waste. The lead-in group, Ball and Jack from Los Angeles, exhibited some real talent. The six-man band had something for every music lover, except Bach. Versatility is the word for this group. In addition to their normal instruments, guitar, bass, drums, saxophone, trombone, and trumpet, they blend clarinets, bells, and tambourines to knock out a very entertaining selection of hard rock folk and Dixieland. 
about the only complaint with the ball and Jack's performance was that it was much too good to be given only 45 minutes to lead into the Hendricks group. To say Hendricks and co. do not have any talent is misleading. Cox and Mitchell are good backup men and probably could put out some good sounds, except that leader Hendricks distracts from them with his attempted playing and singing. His wild gyrations and contortive playing are the most obnoxious, but his singing, which unfortunately could be heard above the noise, is a close second. To make up for his lack of quality, he substitutes quantity and trick guitar playing. It may not have occurred to the average person, but the guitar can be played by mouth, between the legs, behind the head and back, or by rubbing it against a microphone stand. The resulting sound didn't resemble good music, but it did get wild responses from the audience, none of whom would probably be able to vote if the voting age were 18. The first few numbers were bad enough, but when Hendrix started into a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, complete with electronically produced sound effects such as bombs exploding and machine guns firing, the show reached a low point from which it never recovered. By this time the audience was on its feet, dancing in the aisles and chairs. The police gave up trying to seat the swaying, rocking crowd and formed a living fence to keep the stage cleared of everything but the performers. They had the wrong idea. Things would have been better if the audience had been on stage. Their dancing was more entertaining. An advance publicity release said that, when people go to a Hendrix concert, they begin to let their minds flow. They begin to feel the primitive sounds that Jimmy produces from his guitar. One can only hope that the primitives had better taste in music. Tuesday the 9th of June at the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis, Tennessee, and in front of a crowd numbering 3,750, the concert set list included Freedom, Lover Man, Red House, Message to Love, Hear My Train A-Comin', Easy Rider, Room Full of Mirrors, Machine Gun, Hey Joe, Foxy Lady, Star Spangled Banner, Purple Haze and Voodoo Child, Slight Return. In the publication, The Commercial Appeal, in a piece titled Gimmicks Go, Talent Glows, as Hendrix taps acid rock, Beth J. Tamke wrote, A year is a short time, but it can have its effect on a hot acid star who decides to go straight. Jimi Hendrix has played in Memphis twice in the past 13 months. The two performances have been different, and the crowds have varied. On the 18th of April 1969, he brought the Jimi Hendrix experience which was taking the chart watchers by storm. During two performances at the auditorium, 9,176 turned out. Last night at the Mid-South Coliseum, 3,752 showed up. A lot has happened to Jimmy's musical presentation in the year. Shortly before his show here last year, he stomped his guitar, squirted lighter fluid on it, and set it on fire. The crowds went wild. He caressed his guitar, played it with his teeth, rubbed it over various parts of his body, without missing a note. He loved it. The fans dug it and the gate took it all in. The crowd was ready for action last year. They had come to see his gimmicks on a Memphis stage. He was 40 minutes late in starting because his plane was late, and when he played it was with a what-the-hell attitude. Since then, his experience broke up. He tried with a gypsy group which flopped. Now he has Mitch Mitchell back on drums, and he is working Billy Cox from Nashville in on bass. Hendrix says he can make it on his talent without the gimmicks. He is a genius on the strings, but he hasn't had a hit album in a year. Last night he walked on stage calmly and tuned up. Then it began. The acid rock that had accompanied his gimmicks last year took over. Pure acid and funky blues filled the Coliseum and the hearts of the audience. The audience stood up, moved with the sound, and during the last 30 minutes went into orbit. One young man, unidentified, collapsed. He was treated at Methodist Hospital and was released. Officials said the young man was upset. The gimmicks are gone, but the talent is there. Hendrix is an artist, and he will reign again. Wednesday the 10th of June, Roberts Municipal Stadium, Evansville, Indiana. Concert set list, Spanish Castle Magic, Fire, Lover Man, Red House, Foxy Lady, Machine Gun, Message to Love, Freedom, Getting My Heart Back Together Again, The Star Spangled Banner, Purple Haze and Voodoo Child, Slight Return. June 12, 1970, sees the release of the Band of Gypsies album in England through track records. Saturday the 13th of June, Civic Center, Baltimore, Maryland, with support acts, Bowling Jack and Cactus, concert set list comprised, Pass It On, aka Straight Ahead, Lover Man, Machine Gun, Easy Rider, Red House, Message to Love, Hey Joe, Freedom, 
Getting My Heart Back Together Again, Room Full of Mirrors, Foxy Lady, Purple Haze, The Star Spangled Banner, Voodoo Child, Slight Return, Slash Keep On Grooving. According to a Jimi Hendrix Forum review, the musical quality overall is on point, making this concert an essential part of the 1970 tour. The absence of technical problems should be emphasized. Problems of accuracy or amplification are almost absent from this concert. While in the Baltimore Sun, in a review titled Nobody's Going to Upstage Hendrix, James D. Diltz wrote, 7,600 rock fans at the Civic Center waited for Jimi Hendrix, who is a psychedelic rock show all by himself. First was an intervening set by Cactus. It had its rewards, although the group didn't catch fire for me anyway, until the last two tunes. Oleo was made up of pounding rock and roll themes and ad-lib boogie choruses, separated by quiet, introspective sections played by Rusty Day, also the lead singer, who achieved some startling mouth-harp effects. They ranged from a low growl with a voice undertone, similar to the effect Roland Kirk gets when he plays the flute and hums at the same time, to the sound of a lonesome train. The tune also featured an admirable bass solo by Tim Bogart. Feels so good was drummer Carmen Apiece's solo tune. Both Apiece and Bogart were formerly with the Vanilla Fudge. Apiece combined modern Ginger Baker polyrhythms. He uses two bass drums, with some good old Gene Krupa showmanship stick twirling, in a consistently interesting and crowd-pleasing solo. After a second long intermission, with the stage curtain drawn for maximum anticipatory effect, Jimi Hendrix appeared, resplendent in a purple ruffled shirt, green bell bottoms, a silver spangled vest that ended at the shoulder blades, a multicolored headband that trailed down his neck, a bright silk scarf tied to his left arm, and a fringe belt that hung down his right leg. A white guitar with a leopard skin strap completed the ensemble. The Yorktown light show paled in comparison. I wasn't sure what to expect from Hendrix, never having witnessed a live performance, but having absorbed over the past few years a measure of the legend that has grown up around him. It is certainly true that during all the frenetic activity on stage, the music sometimes took second place, yet it was always there. For the Civic Center show, Hendrix brought with him bassist Billy Cox from the Gypsy Band and drummer Mitch Mitchell from the original experience. Both are thoroughly supportive musicians. Let's face it, no one is going to upstage Hendrix anyway, musically or visually. He's got the brightest clothes and most of the speakers, and Mitchell's drumming is a delight. Quick, crisp, and swinging. The group was all business, starting out with the blues, and pausing only long enough at its conclusion for Hendrix to acknowledge the beginning of the applause before saying rapidly into the microphone, Hello, Baltimore, how are you? Before moving on to the next number. They followed in rapid succession, Machine Gun from the Band of Gypsies album with Hendrix drumming out chords on his guitar and Mitchell answering with rapid fire rolls from the snare, Hey Joe, Foxy Lady, and a dozen or so others. Eh. Hendrix seems to have given up the sideshow antics, except for a few brief bars near the end of the concert when he played the guitar with his teeth and such relatively subtle devices for him anyway as falling suggestively on the wah-wah pedal. Perhaps he doesn't need them anymore. Suggestion has replaced overstatement. That doesn't mean that Hendrix isn't still able to conjure up, with a slight turn of his wrist, awesome, searing audio power through his wraparound speaker set up and then shut it off with a shrug of the shoulder. He is still able with the sullen, unsmiling look, heavy business, to draw the fans down front of the stage, as he did at the end of the show at the Civic Center. It's just that music is now at the center of the group's presentation, which is, of course, where it should be. And regardless what you might think of it, Hendrix's music, a combination of tough, bluesy vocal and instrumental delivery mixed with speaker feedback, is unlike any sound to be heard in contemporary rock. Hendrix concluded the concert with a tortured instrumental version of the Star Spangled Banner, the like of which, it's safe to say, has never been witnessed in the birthplace of the national anthem. The audience, for what it's worth, exhibited a good deal more interest in the song than the usual civic center crowd waiting none too patiently for the basketball game to start. Again, it may be that Hendrix is turning more political now. After a final number, one fist raised in the symbol of rebellion, the other giving the peace sign, Hendrix was off the stage as quickly as he had appeared. Right on, shouted several people in the crowd. Monday the 15th of June, Jimmy held his first recording session at Electric Lady Studios, recording various takes of Isabella, Easy Rider, and a new recording called All God's Children. 
Later in the evening, Jimmy welcomes his friends Steve Winwood and Chris Wood from the band traffic. With Mitch Mitchell being unavailable, it was with Dave Palmer, former drummer of Amboy Dukes, with whom Jimmy recorded an impromptu jam session. Before leaving, Winwood and Wood lent their voices to Easy Rider. Their efforts can be heard on both versions of the song that were recorded. Tuesday the 16th of June, at Electric Lady Studios Recordings, Nightbird Flying, Straight Ahead, Beginning, then Jam Session with Richie Havens and Eric Oxendine on bass. Eric Oxendine recalled, Jimi Hendrix invited Richie Havens and I over in the summer of 1970 while he was preparing a new album, Cry of Love. After hearing Jimmy on an overdub of a song, we went to Electric Lady Studio A to have a totally impromptu jam session. Richie started playing a simple chord progression. For a few minutes, not much happened. Kramer was recording the session. Jimmy and I started joining in. Well, after a few minutes, nothing was happening, so I started playing the main melody. At first, I was cautious. I didn't want the song to be missed, so I took the lead line on my Fender P bass. We played through two more songs and I realized how historic this impromptu jam session with Jimmy and Richie truly was. So I tried to save the music. The song is longer, but I edited it at the right part. I called it Dreamin', since I played the lead bass instrument. I don't know who, but someone later tried drum and piano overdubs. There are now dozens of pirated copies circulating on the internet and YouTube. It's another reminder that, in the music business, it's sometimes hard to hold on to music that's actually yours. According to John McDermott, Two reel-to-reel -reel freeform jams featuring blues guitarist Richie Havens were recorded during this undated session in early June. Cox and an unnamed drummer and pianist joined Havens and Hendrix in a long, rambling, mid-to-fast tempo blues jam. Eric Oxendine disputes John McDermott's comments. John McDermott is wrong. Cox wasn't there. This is my distinct bass playing. The memory recorded above is especially ironic, considering that just two years prior, I had jammed with Jimmy at the Generation Club, which was now Electric Lady Studios. Wednesday 17th and Thursday the 18th of June, at Electric Lady Studios, recordings. Straight ahead, Drifter's Escape, Astro Man, Come Down Hard on Me, Freedom, and Easy Rider. Friday the 19th of June, Civic Auditorium, Albuquerque, New Mexico for two concerts, with no known set lists available, the Albuquerque Tribune summed up one of the concert performances as follows. Jimi Hendrix's appearance at the Civic Auditorium was a disappointment. If it's possible, Hendrix has become too proficient with his trade, the guitar. So easy was it for him to strum and pick his way through the numbers that his mood was one of complete nonchalance. He simply stood in front of the mic, slowly munched his gum, let his eyes close and played his white guitar. Saturday the 20th of June Swing Auditorium, San Bernardino, California. Concert set list. All along the watchtower. Room full of mirrors, machine gun. Message to love. Getting my heart back together again. Foxy Lady. Hey Joe. Purple Haze and Voodoo Child. Slight return. The following review appeared in The Sun Telegram. Titled 7,300 Fans. Set a new attendance record by Tom Green. Jimi Hendrix broke things up at San Bernardino Swing Auditorium on Saturday night. Figuratively and literally. The thing that got broken most resoundingly was the Swing's attendance record. Hendrix pulled in 7,300 music fans and that shattered the old mark of 7,100, which belonged to Credence Clearwater Revival. Of course, a door got broken too, because there were dozens more outside who couldn't get in because of the sold-out sign. Police had to be called with tear gas to get those unhappy people dispersed. No problems were reported inside, though. The show got going at about 8, and wound up at about 10.45 p.m., which was obviously a surprise to some fans who thought it would go on until midnight, and arrived, therefore, after it was over. Hendrix is quite an entertainer, as simple as that. Sunday, the 21st of June, Ventura County Fairgrounds, Ventura, California, with support acts bawling Jack and Grin. According to Robert Peters, in a piece titled A Foggy Day at the County Fairgrounds, the Ventura County Fairgrounds Arena is a large outdoor dirt oval track, with stadium bleachers on the northwest side. It was built mainly for equestrian shows and competitions and was not well suited as a concert venue. The stage was a 40-foot flat bed truck trailer parked parallel to the bleachers on the opposite side of the dirt oval. Wooden shipping pallets were lashed together along the side of the trailer, facing the bleachers. 
and a ten-foot plywood wall ran along the back of the trailer, with stair access on the right rear side. The Ventura County Fairgrounds Arena is only about 800 yards from the Pacific Ocean, and on this particular evening heavy fog was rolling in off the ocean. The fog made it very difficult for those seated in the bleachers to get an unobscured view of the concert stage. At times I could barely see the bleachers through the fog from my location, directly in front of the stage. It was also drizzling lightly, which led me to wonder if the concert would be cancelled due to the increasingly inclement weather. About 7.10 p.m., and without announcement, Jimi Hendrix, Billy Cox and Mitch Mitchell walked onto the stage. Jimi was wearing a long cape, which he later removed. The three readied their equipment and began playing. The audience, which was expecting to see the opening act bawling Jack, was largely caught by surprise at this unexpected turn of events. The Jimi Hendrix experience played several unreleased songs, songs from their Band of Gypsies album, including an extended version of Machine Gun, and did the obligatory Purple Haze and Foxy Lady, during which Jimmy did his now expected stage theatrics of playing the guitar with his teeth and playing crouched down with his Stratocaster between his legs. The set performed by the experience had no outstanding moments that I can remember. On this particular night, Jimmy seemed to be going through the motions as he ran through his bag of tricks. After playing for approximately 50 minutes, the Jimi Hendrix experience ended a song and without a word to the audience left the stage. The crowd applauded tepidly, probably not realizing that the performance was over. Jimmy always played at least one encore number, but on this night the experience didn't come back for encores, and their set ended as suddenly as it started. It was a little past 8 p.m., and the headlining act, which normally wouldn't have even played yet, had already finished their set and left. After a twenty-minute or so intermission, while the stage was readied for the next band, Balling Jack, the opening band turned closing band, took the stage and played their set. Remarkably, the audience stuck it out in the fog and drizzle, maybe in hopes that Jimmy would play a second set, which he never did. They may also have realized that they were getting gypped and decided to stick it out until they felt they had gotten their money's worth. While the Star Free Press commented, The Jimi Hendrix Experience Rock Concert drew an enthusiastic crowd of nearly 4,000 last night at the county fairgrounds in Ventura. Another group of 400 youths tried to crash the gates for free entry and a small conflict between them and 80 policemen and sheriff's deputies erupted. The youths threw rocks and bottles at police. No one was hurt. Fifteen were arrested for unlawful assembly. Tuesday, the 23rd of June, the Mammoth Gardens, Denver, Colorado concert was cancelled despite tickets having been sold. Then Thursday, the 25th of June, the proposed concert at the Civic Arena, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is also cancelled. Meanwhile, back at the Electric Lady Studios, Jimmy works on recordings of Freedom, Drifting, Astro Man and Pally Gap. Saturday, the 27th of June, Boston Garden, Boston, Massachusetts, with support acts, The Illusion and Cactus, Concert Set List, Stone Free, Lover Man, Red House, Freedom, Foxy Lady, Purple Haze, The Star Spangled Banner, All Along the Watchtower, Message to Love, Fire, Spanish Castle Magic and Voodoo Child, Slight Return. The following review appeared in Boston After Dark, titled, Hendrix Was Good by GP. Fulfilling his promise to come to Boston after having cancelled last year's Summer Thing appearance, Jimi Hendrix finally arrived experience and all. Those who have had the enjoyable pleasure of previously witnessing Mr. Hendrix could have more wisely utilized their time and money elsewhere. Naturally, Hendrix was his clever self, swinging and swaying, grinding to the oft high-pitched whining guitar, plucking with his teeth. But it was not the same dynamic tension of two years ago, the infamous stone rapping that pleased so many, the excitement of his stage theatrics. To begin with, the warm-up acts were, for the most part, tedious. Illusion did succeed in spiriting the solemn audience into a clapping, foot-stomping exercise, but loudness prevailed throughout most of their set. Cactus commenced with a healthy rebel-rousing long, tall sally, but quickly settled down into a monotonous routine. Bass player Tim Bogert, formerly with the Vanilla Fudge, contributed his usual sparkling performance, but the lack of musical coherence among the group failed to ignite anything positive. Adding to the sheer immensity of the Boston Garden was the noticeably bitchy attitude of our darling police force, which received immeasurable satisfaction out of keeping the aisles clear of spectators digging the concert or taking pictures. Cactus's lead singer wanted the garden throng to enjoy themselves and never mind the blue coats, but it is difficult because of the cow barn atmosphere and formality of North Station. 
I was hoping for Hendrix to somehow unite the stragglers. However, the customary procedure of an hour playing time unfortunately became the rule. To no avail would sensual Jimmy return for an encore, and I think the bummer environment proved too much for him. Hendrix is used to spontaneity, aroused passion and clean air. Hendrix was good. His guitar dexterity never ceases to amaze me, and his colorful attire has to be seen to be believed, but the man is much more. The people loved him. They clapped and applauded where necessary and generally approved of what they saw. I guess that's all that really matters. While Timothy Krauss, in a review titled Pop Music, Jimi Hendrix, at the Boston Garden, wrote the following. Jimi Hendrix came to Boston Garden on Saturday night and proved that he is once again in top form. Playing with him were Mitch Mitchell, the drummer who worked in the original Jimi Hendrix experience, and Billy Cox, who served as bassist in Hendrix's most recent group, Band of Gypsies. Together the trio produced a sound that was almost symphonic. Hendrix's absolutely certain rhythmic sense never lapsed for a moment. His guitar technique was flawless. Hendrix's perfection of style is especially astounding because it rose up amid the excesses of psychedelic rock, a genre which has traditionally been mindless, sloppy and overpraised. During his set, Hendrix seldom took his foot of the wah-wah pedal and seldom played a line that was not distorted by echoes, shrill or fuzz. Yet his rhythm is so perfect and his playing so fluid that he shapes all the distortion into coherent music. Hendrix gave a complete performance. Dressed in fluorescent red pants and a tunic with cathedral sleeves, he moved with the grace of a panther. He was beautiful to watch. The audience, which to judge from its indiscriminately enthusiastic reaction to the warm-up acts, knew very little, did know it's Hendrix. The crowd responded as one. For certain songs, the congregation rose and clapped in time. For others, the congregation remained seated. All the responses seemed to have been agreed upon in advance. There were two warm-up acts. The four members of Cactus, two of them refugees from the old vanilla fudge, huffed, puffed and pounded away with an utter lack of rhythmic sense. Their sound was radically unbalanced to such an extent that the sloppy work of the vocalist drowned out the drummer. Cactus served as an ideal foil to Hendrix. They played the same kind of distorted rock without having the least idea what they were doing. Monday the 29th of June and Tuesday the 30th of June at Electric Lady Studios. Recording, including overdubs and mixing for Drifting, Freedom and Drifter's Escape. That concludes this installment of the series. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we will begin the deep dive into July 1970 of the Jimi Hendrix story and the continuing Cry of Love US tour, including the Atlanta Pop Festival. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way, if you have any photos, stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Until next time.